I'm extremely fortunate in that I've been working for quite a few years now with a group at Melbourne University that is considered, and I don't want to big note ourselves here, but it is considered probably the leading research centre in learning environments research internationally, based on the evidence of the outputs from our work. You're all going to spend a lot of money on some fantastic spaces, and apart from them actually being pretty, will they actually work? How will you know whether they're as effective as you want them to be? Let me start with some quotes that have been published around these types of innovative spaces. Students nowadays are getting so much information, we can't teach them what that information is. We have to teach them how to access it and use it. Teachers can't just stand in front of one class. Teachers have got so many skills, they should be available to all students whenever they're particularly needed. We're recognising more and more that students themselves learn as much from each other collaborating, working together on problems, as Carly and Theo were doing in that, that animation, as they do from the teachers themselves. The spaces themselves matter. Spaces need to be flexible. They need to allow for the type of learning that kids want to do and the type of teaching that teachers want to do. Teachers shouldn't be hamstrung by walls that are in place where they shouldn't be, by doors that don't open, by not having the material that they need accessible to do a particular thing when they actually need it. And of course, the differentiated learning mechanism comes through all of this as well. Our programs have to recognise the fact that all kids learn differently, all teachers teach differently, and the reality is that um, we need to be able to build into our program that sort of differentiated, individualised learning and assessment plans that have been a requirement for a long time. We've got to keep doing that. The thing that worries me about these quotes, I think they're marvellous, the thing that worries me is they are not quotes from now. These are quotes that came from a school in the United States in the 1970s as part of the open plan movement. And that's an open plan movement that actually didn't work. That withdrew, some of the schools still exist, but not all of them. So why did they fail? Because that's the general consensus. These places didn't work. And don't forget we're talking here about the same places you guys are now building and putting into practice. The same basic philosophies exist. Why did they fail? First is there was resistance. A lot of parents quite understandably said, my child can't learn in an environment like this. My child needs individualised attention in terms of sitting him or her down and making sure he or she works. My child will be lost in amongst all of those kids. My child won't know where to go to learn. In effect, what happened was our parents were saying, I grew up in a traditional learning environment. That's what I know. That's what I want for my child. And of course, I'm not blaming parents totally in this but they certainly have um, influence, and they influence politicians who in turn influence those who make decisions on what does and does not get done in our schooling system. That certainly wasn't their fault. The fault actually lies here in that last particular um, thing, and that is when you look back at the data that existed from this period of time, there was almost no evidence that showed whether they were effective or not. There was, effective, there was evidence to, to suggest that actually they were highly um, um, influential in particular areas, but the evidence was never overwhelming. So who knows something about evidence at the moment? You'll recognise John Hattie. In this photo is looking more like a Rolling Stones guitarist than uh, anything else. John is, became known because of his book about visible learning, and we all know it and have heard of it. That book in itself is, a, is an example of the way evidence can be used to create scenarios to drive the strategies that in turn become the things that we do in the classroom. A convoluted trail, but it's a trail that we have to follow. John's um, synthesis of meta-analysis basically looked at those places where there was evidence taken from a report. Let's say for his thing, he was only looking at learning outcomes. What impacts kids' learning outcomes? A meta-analysis can be made up of hundreds and hundreds of studies. And we have many, many bundles of studies or meta-analysis that are actually looking at students' learning outcomes. And what John did was so smart, we see then did a meta-analysis of meta-analysis. He pulled all of that material together. You're talking here about hundreds of thousands of quality pieces of research. And what John did with that was then he published his hierarchy of what's effective in terms of teaching based on that evidence. It is so strong that the visible learning aspect now is becoming um, well known around the world and being utilised in many places to affect um, teacher practices in classrooms. But in effect what John did was he said, when you look at all the particular material that exists out there, what actually makes a difference? Let's not waste our time doing things that actually have got no significant impact on kids' learning, because that's what we're there for. 
John published those, according to the data from his um, synthesis, in a hierarchy from one down to, I think, about 240 or 250 now. These are the factors that make a difference. And guess what's at the top? We already know that. The teacher. The teacher is most important. Interestingly, in this one, I just pulled this at random, but there's inquiry learning. Flourishing, not where it should. It's way down towards the bottom. What John has done effectively is he says that when you've got a, um, a group of um, things that you do like this, um, the, the hierarchies, etc., you look at the effect size and you say, if it's any less than 0.4 of an effect size, then it's actually not improving the kids' learning during the period of the year. In other words, 0.4 is what you'd expect a normal child to progress in a normal classroom with the normal material. Anything above that, you're actually improving the kids' learning outcomes. Anything below that, you're not adding to it. From that, John made up his hierarchy, his list of mind frames. He looked at those particular factors that were rated highest, according to the data, and from that he drew up his, his characteristics that make those things happen. And he's come up with 10. It started at 8, now it's at 10. Who knows where it will finish, but he'll keep going at it, I'm sure. These teacher mind frames is something I want you to keep in your mind for a few minutes, because I'm going to come back to it in a minute with some other data. But they are the characteristics that we as teachers, if we have this mindset, this, these sets of mind frames, there's every chance we will be helping students um, to improve their learning outcomes above the 0.4 hinge point that John talks about. So let's start talking about learning environments, the sorts of spaces that you guys are so heavily involved in. According to all the data that's available at the moment, that is robust and can be seen to fit into the stringent requirements of a mental analysis, the actual environments within which kids learn has no effect on their learning outcome at all. It rates so lowly that I just put in a guess at 220. I was too depressed to try and count how far down learning environments actually comes. And here's the other part, just to bring us back to a bit of reality in what we're doing here with our lovely spaces we're building. These items here have a greater impact on students' learning outcomes than the environments we're building. If the kid went to summer school during the summer, that child is more likely to do better in school. If the child was breastfed as a baby, there's a correlation between breastfeeding and students' um, improved learning. Chess instruction, if kids learn to play chess, then there's every chance that they will actually do better in school. So we've got a battle in front of us because we are putting into place significant investments into these learning environments and this is the evidence that underpins it. John came up with this in his visible learning book. There is no evidence to show that classrooms make any difference to student learning outcomes. But actually, it's on that point that John and I have had many discussions, and it's an important point. There is no evidence to show. The five most misused words in research, just because there's no evidence to show doesn't necessarily mean it's not the case. All it means is the research hasn't been done. The evidence hasn't been shown yet. Why do you think John joined me in this project? He said, Wes, the space must make a difference. It has to. Let's go out and find some evidence to see whether that's the case or not. And I'm trying to get across this point today about the need that we have, the demand we must meet of gathering good evidence around what we're doing. So we found, after going through a long time of searching, doing, putting search terms together that encompass all the things we need to do and finding the databases that are going to give us the best articles from that, we found 5, 000, more than 5,000 articles that touch on student learning outcomes and space. Through the uh, systematic review process, it's, it's a, a process you go through to slowly but surely get rid of the stuff that's not as, as robust, not as good. By the time we um, got rid of duplicates, by the time we actually went through the abstracts and decided, no, that is not a study worthy of this particular review, we ended up with 21 articles. We're talking here about 21 articles of any quality, of good quality, that's been produced since 1960. 21 articles on environments, learning environments, innovative learning environments, and students' learning. I don't know about you, I think it's a pitiful amount of, of data for us to be working with. Let's look at some of those things. I haven't put them all in here, just a few. But if you have a look at them, you see there's a range in here that actually touch on what you're talking about. There's a couple in there that look at innovative learning environments and technologies and the impact that actually has on students' learning. You'll notice here as well that the articles that come from the 1970s tend to be negative, that there was actually no link between space and quality of learning. 
the ones that have been done recently in the 2020s or the 20s um, seem to be more positive. But don't forget, we only have 21 articles that actually would meet Hattie's um, quality for his synthesis, synthesis. Interestingly, the three that I've shown you just then that um, are highlighted are the only three that actually report an effect size. And that means there's only three of these articles written since 1960 that could go into a meta-analysis for John to change his mind about the impact of learning environments. Three. 